Get ready to go live. You are live, it's telling me. I am live here, Sabian Education Network. Hi, guys. I'm Don Femularo. I'm so honored to be a part of this because I get the chance to have some time with some fantastic drummers and great educators. Today, please welcome Mr. Mike Dopke. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, you're going to have to give me uh, the 10 seconds to play fanboy with you for a sec because Dom Famularo is a name I've been seeing in Modern Drummer Magazine since I started playing. And, oh. you know, I, I remember like uh, one of the, uh, as a kid, I did a marching, like a band camp, like a day camp kind of a thing for marching percussion. And uh, you authored uh, one of the exercises that they handed out. Oh. Uh, so I've, I've been seeing Dom for a long time. So I said, Dom's going to interview you. I'm like, eh. <laughs> you know, so, well, thanks, while so I'm, well, yeah, I'm going like, oh, man, cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to be here. It's like inside. I'm like Garth going like. <laughs> well, Mike, really excited. just to let you know, I think I have underwear older than you. So that is really, really <laughs> an important part of the journey of getting older, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's I believe it. <laughs> Great stuff, Mike. You know, I'll tell you something. I'm so impressed with a lot of the video stuff that I've seen of yourself and just hearing your reputation as a player and as an educator at MI, man. You really... You're oh. really doing a lot, and I want to kind of hit all aspects of, of what you're about so people get to know you and know sure. how to contact you, you know, so they can get a hold of you on your website, on your social media, because I think anyone that's listening to our voice, whether it's now live or later on when this is recorded and on Facebook and Sabian's YouTube channel, I, sure. went, I went them to seek you out for lessons for sure. Thank you for the plug. I appreciate okay. it, and I'll be... I, I mean, it sounds cliche. I love teaching, but I really love teaching and giving people, uh, you know, on lesson or online lessons, whether it's their first lesson or whether they've been playing for 20 years. It's like, yeah. I love it. It's like, yeah, contact me. You can, uh, my website is just Mike uh, all one word. And I'm, uh, my Twitter and my Instagram is both, I think they're both Mike Dupke drums. Uh, right. if you search that out and, um, yeah. I, or yeah, either through my website or any of those or Facebook as well. Find me, Fantastic. contact me, and would love to hook up. Fantastic, Michael. Well, I know you're you're out in the LA area, so people can can connect with you and do it. Now, a couple of things. Now, you started at a young age playing, so just fill me in a little bit on on what connected you to drumming. Um, I was one of a billion child Kiss fans. I think. <laughs> um, you know, I remember like a, in a documentary, Paul Stanley was saying that he thought something was wrong when, you know, it was like 78 or something. And, and he looked out in the line uh, of, of KISS fans to get in the concert. And he goes, it was families. And it was four-year-olds. I'm like, well, I was one of the four-year-olds. I never got to go see them until later. But uh, they they were my favorite band when I was in kindergarten. So Peter Chris um, was uh, definitely a, a first influence once I heard what they sounded like. Because I thought they were a disco band. The first song I heard by them was I Was Made For Loving You. So that, And I liked disco at the time as a toddler. And I said, uh, oh, there's in this new disco band called Kiss. And then my my library had uh, it had records that where you could, you know, check out records along with books. And I and I found Alive. And, I, and my parents, you know, I convinced them somehow to let me check that out and bring it home. And then, of course, you know, you hear what, kiss really sounded like and you know it's like oh all right i found this this is my new thing now i'm home and that has pretty much lasted for about 40 years uh, so peter chris definitely and um the as much as i have to admit as as a little little kid the muppet show was was a, a huge influence and you know oh muppets okay but like you know jim henson was responsible for being the first time I saw some great artists, you know, Dizzy Gillespie, Gladys Knight, Alice Cooper, you know, Rudolf Nureyev, Harry Belafonte. It's like the first time I heard of any of those people, Lena Horne, any of those people was on, was on the Muppet show and reading the credits to some of the like Muppet albums that I had later on. Uh, a lot of that stuff was done by Hal Blaine. Yeah. So when you think about animal Animal had some taste and some groove and some chops to him, man. Like, he was no slouch. Animal also <laughs> had to play against Buddy Rich. That in itself was a whole nother task. <laughs> he did, yeah. <laughs> that's well, that's, that's so one of the, the best clips they ever had, yeah. 
So was the, was, was the school music program helpful for you when you, when you were young? Um, I'd, I'd say yes and no. Um, only no in, in the fact that like they, we had like music class once a week, but it was um, mainly learning songs that we were going to sing in church. Mm. Um, they didn't play Kiss in my, uh, in my, I, I grew up uh, with going to Catholic school. Uh, so yeah, when I brought in, um, you were allowed to bring in records to play like during art time and stuff like that. And I remember bringing in Destroyer and um, my teacher going, no, no, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, so that, that kind of crushed me. Um, there was fun stuff like when there was percussion day when they gave everybody something to bang on and that was fun. Um, but no, mostly I, I found, you know, time, alone with my KISS records was uh, was much more preferable to to the school music program. And actually, as far as drums, um, I was kind of a late bloomer. I didn't start formally taking drum lessons until I was 13. Um, I had piano. Before that, I studied piano for about uh, four years. And ultimately, you know, when it comes to drum set, that was helpful because you learn to read music. Um, independence between right and left hand was very painful. But, you know, my, my parents always had to yell at me to practice my piano. And then when I convinced them to let me take up drums, you know, then then they were yelling at me, stop, enough. Oh, <laughs> come on, it's 10 o'clock. We got to go to bed. Uh, so, yeah, that was, I guess, kind of a late bloomer. But I just I took to it, you know, immediately and. Um, definitely knew I found my instrument when I started then. Well, you know, it's really amazing the, the, the power. I had the chance of several times meeting Peter Chris and uh, what, what a wonderful person and just a, a great, you know, inspiration for the years that that band played. So here you are. You're, were there any other bands other than Kiss that you started to listen to at this time? Um, well, like, after, my, after my disco phase when I was five, um, <laughs> I, uh, other rock bands came into the, into the fray. Um, a lot of just the, the typical 80s radio stuff. Like, you know, you took it like, you know, hits of the 80s, what was played on on FM. It's like, I was into that. The the very first record, I, I was given a Kiss record like almost every Christmas for about 10 years straight. But the first record I bought with my own money, I remember was uh, Huey Lewis and the News' Sports record. Yeah. Um, so there was that, and then getting into like, you know, Michael Jackson's thriller exploded and took over the world. Van Halen's 1984, uh, was a, another big one Yeah. when I was a kid. And, uh, um, but also like a, my dad played, wasn't a, you know, gigantic music fan, but he, he was, he, he liked jazz a lot. And so I remember, uh, uh, Dave Brubeck's take five or, or you know, time out, uh, record with Take Five and Blue Rondo a la Turk and those yeah. uh, was played a lot. and Or he liked uh, Modern Jazz Quartet also with uh, Milton Jackson. Uh, that was big. And they like stuff like, you know, the Manhattan Transfer and my mom listened to Willie Nelson, you know, sometimes. But uh, the the rock was definitely something that I found on my own and, and you know, eventually pursued. But there seemed like there was a wide variety of music that you were listening to, which was pretty powerful because, you know, you, you, you have a, an incredible – control over the instrument that you can play all different styles and you've got a, a a feel that can be adapted to any of those oh thanks i yeah i i definitely learning how to play jazz uh, one of the biggest challenges for me was just bringing it down in volume you know because i heard you know sing 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 or something like that and and it energized me to to such an extent that I just wanted to go you know, and you know ultimately it's like no there's control got to got to bring it down a little bit but um i still you know it doesn't matter if it's jazz classical it's like it, there's a lot of, if it's meant to be played loud you know it's it's probably something that i'm going to love <laughs> but thank you also that you that very kind oh, of you really? to say I, a lot of my my favorites have been guys like that like my the guys i'm influenced by the most tend to be drummers in the in the rock or metal field but that i know have really diverse backgrounds yeah. uh and and have uh, you know applying other influences to to rock music and you know i love that guys like like anton fig 
yeah. uh, when I was growing up with the with the Letterman show. When when the VCR came around and I started taping Letterman and you know watching him play uh, in the in, in the world's most dangerous band, it's like that was always a highlight for me. Just getting to watch Anton do anything. Boy, it, well, it's amazing. I want everyone to understand that when you mention names like Peter Chris, and if you're not familiar with Peter's playing, which means you probably live in a cave, but if that's the way it is, <laughs> do the research. But you mentioned Dave Brubeck. That was Joe Morello on drums. Joe, who I studied with for many years, and Morello was an incredible master at, as, as an educator and as a performer. And then you mentioned Hal Blaine, who we just lost uh, about a year and a half ago. Hal Blaine, another yeah. player who played a wide variety of songs. So you're talking about listening, being aware of different, different styles of drummers, which was very, very, you know, uh, good to have that at that age. So now you end up mm -hmm. going to Indiana University School of Music and you meet That's up right. with Kenny Arnold. Tell me about that. That was a, an incredible stroke of luck. Um, I knew when I graduated from high school, I grew up in Michigan and uh, I wanted, you know, parents encouraged me to, to, to go to college. And uh, I knew I wanted to study music. And so uh, some of my options as far as being close by, because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't ready to go to New York or, or L.A. at that point. So Indiana, I guess, was a way of staying reasonably close to home. Um, and at the time, I knew that there were, you know, they were uh, nationwide, uh, uh, you know, highly regarded uh, music education place. But I didn't know that Kenny was going to be there until after I got there. And uh, I auditioned for the music school and got in after I got down there right as Kenny was about to start. So I actually got to be one of five students and actually one of only two freshmen. Um, the other actually being my roommate, Tommy Deal, uh, and another Sabian guy, uh, yeah. which, which you know, just by a fluke. And both of us got uh, ended up getting to study with Kenny and being the only freshman. And that was, I we could talk this entire time just about Kenny because massive, massive influence. I studied with him for about four and a half years. Yeah. And just, oh, man, in terms of, you know, I can't think of really another guy who, especially then, but still to this day, is you know is out there doing it, is out there working. I don't know how he fit in fifteen lessons a semester with each student, but he was able to do it. Um, although he'd even tell you that the last lesson for everybody was the party at his house at the end of uh, at the end of the <laughs> semester, which was great. Um, but you know he's you know. You've heard Kenny talk. It's like, yeah, I'm going to go. He was on tour with Joe Cocker. He goes, yeah, I'm going to go do a Cocker show in Austin. And then he flew back to New York to rehearse with Ricky Martin for the Letterman show. And then he th then he flew back to, to Arizona for another show and then flew back that night to tape the Letterman show with Ricky Martin and then flew back. It's like, you know, and it's like, yeah, I'm doing all that. All right, let's hear some paradiddles. And I was just like, <laughs> wait, hold on. I want to hear about like the gig, you know, I, he was doing what I wanted to do. And, and, but just also like, you know, the nicest, one of the nicest guys on the planet, you know, and just you, when you're around him for any more than 60 seconds, you get a taste of his energy and you see why he works as much as he did. He is infectious to be around his, his positivity and energy. It just, goes you know straight at you musically too and it's just it's so wonderful he taught me so much that i still put into practice you know to this day kenny is uh is an incredible you know player and educator and 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 his commitment to health and well-being and mental you know you know discipline is really pretty powerful i've known kenny now for probably about 40 years and his story was as a young kid he Heard the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show and always wanted to play with that band, as it, but he, he told his mom. And then years later, when the Beatles had their <laughs> anniversary on, on the, at the same time, on the same date, you know, 50 years later, there was Kenny on drums playing with uh, Paul McCartney and Ringo coming up. So it was a pretty powerful, you know, circle yeah. Kenny experience with it. But Kenny also, a very school drummer, he studied under Vic Firth at the New England Conservatory of Music. So, you know, Kenny was a very, very school drummer. So you had some great, great. You know, you, you know, education from Kenny. Were you working on books? Were you working on techniques? What are you working on with Kenny? Um, technique, and uh, there were there were certain things that 
he had to do as far as, as the school requirements was concerned. Like uh, at IU, you had three options. You could either be education, which meant you had to also learn how to play trumpet, clarinet, saxophone, trombone, and, and everything else. Um, classical percussion, which meant you also had to study timpani, uh, you know, uh, crash cymbals, triangle, and, and, you know, everything that the classical world involves, or wow. jazz. Wow. And if you were a drum set player, you went in for the jazz major. So that was, that was what I did. Um, and on top of that, you know, we did have to learn mallet pieces. You know, I, I had never improvised on vibes, like until I got to IU, but the, the piano background did help me with that. Um, even if playing a piano with sticks was completely foreign and, you know, and for like my senior recital, I had to do a timpani piece. And I remember thinking it was kind of study that here I am with one of the greatest legends of drum set of modern time, you know, is going out and playing and we're, you know, we're going over timpani technique and I'm kind of like, <laughs> let's, let's do some rock stuff. But we did plenty of rock stuff too. Um, the, I remember on one of the very first assignments that he gave to the students, he goes, all right, he goes, I want you all to transcribe back in black, note for note, like you write it out and be able, and then play it and perform it. And not only, being able to listen and to get the parts right, but also then to play it with the proper feel. You know, that's one of those songs. It's like it, it, it one of those mid tempos. I'm sure you know that can easily be too fast or too slow. Yeah. You know, I'm, I've no doubt you've heard that song butchered by, <laughs> you know, umpteen kids. You know, probably you know, like would, I'm gonna throw some double bass in there. It's like oh 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 no, fired. Um, or and and just in the opening riff, you know, dent. And Kenny describing that snare backbeat is a good, it's almost like a tiny little solo every time because that snare drum stands on its own. Yeah. So he would he would listen to us play it and you know kind of and and he would tell us you know on on ahead behind yeah. behind ahead on with with the backbeat yeah. and that was the the first real big kind of wake up call as far as consistency is like doesn't matter if you if you know the part it's like you got to play it in in that way that makes people want to strut down the street and anything short of that it's like you got something to work on well absolutely you know, and it, it's it's so good as you're talking about this here too and, and i you know we've got many different people that are logging on from all around the world from uh, oh nice belgium from the ukraine victoria from the ukraine bruno from from antwerp belgium we've got people from brazil uh you know uh, uh, regis Ortez. So I ask everybody, if you have any questions, put them in the chat section. And also, let us know where you're from. We have someone that just said they're from Kentucky. So you've got a real wide variety. Of my <laughs> you've got some Kentucky, serious fans, serious fans <laughs> around Kentucky, the world. Kentucky and Belgium in the house at the same time. I love it. Bringing Man, people together. That's, that's what it's all about. <laughs> some serious combination. So in this here now, you, you come out of school. Where was the first gig that you hit? I know you did this MTV Human Wheels thing and you did the Arsenio Hall show. When did that all start to happen after university? Oh, yeah, that was actually while uh, I was going on. That was actually my sophomore year. Um, I hit, and, and, and it's strange. This is why I tell my students, it's like, unless, the opportunity comes along unless your gut is telling you, no, avoid this at all costs. It's like, give it a try. It might turn into something. I did, I did marching band at IU. Um, because I'd, I'd gone through marching band all through all four years of high school because it was so much fun. And you had to be in the marching band at IU to be in the big red basketball pep band mm -hmm. with uh, Bobby Bobby Knight, still uh, head coach at that time. So basketball, while our football team was nothing really to write home about, um, basketball was huge. And so I, and, and basketball was drum set as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, a, a drum line. And it was kind of funny because you, you know, you're playing literally it was the first arena that I played and you're playing an unmiked drum kit behind like a 100 piece horn band. So <laughs> they wanted someone, you know, rather than, you know, they wanted someone to, you know, bash and put on a show. And I was like, I'm your guy. Oh, so I, I got, uh, I got to be one of like four drummers. Uh, and then while I'm studying with Kenny, He's still working with Mellencamp at the time, and and the, they put out the Human Wheels record, right, which right. he they experimented with a bunch of percussion. Like Kenny said, he you know put shakers and weird stuff. Like like they mic'd up a, a potato chip can, and he played that on one song. 
And because of all this extra percussion, they wanted uh, someone to to come in and just and play stuff alongside of Kenny. And I guess Mellencamp said, "Ah, oh, like there's there's that one kid in the pep band, like uh, you know." And Kenny was like, "Oh, that's my student." And so, fingers crossed. I hope they were talking to me because there were like four of us. But <laughs> Kenny, he goes, "Do you want to play some percussion next to me for some Mellencamp gigs?" And this was uh, the summer of '93, and uh, I was 19 when he asked me to do it. And it's like, uh, sure. Yeah, I can do that. So the, yeah, that, that MTV special in Chicago was the, was the first thing that we taped. We played the whole human wheels record. Uh, and I played, you know, bongos, congas, shakers, tambourines. And one of the, my, my favorite part was one of those big seventies metal Brady bunch trash cans turned upside down and put on a, on a conga stand. I just beat that with sticks. It was great. Um, and so we did that and then we did the Arsenio Hall show and, uh, I got to be in one of his videos. And then later on, uh, Mellencamp at one point, uh, I think he decided that he, he wanted to do just a straight up rock and roll record. And he was going to record the whole thing in like two weeks. And Kenny being Kenny was, was already booked. You know, he was getting months booked months ahead of time at this point. And so there was a little bit of friction there maybe. And so I think, for as much as I'd like to think, believe it was my, you know, you know, the original take I had in the, I think maybe uh, Mellencamp said, well, I'll show you, I'll get your student to come in. So I actually, I tracked, I, I did some tracking of songs from him. And it was so weird because like, I actually, I didn't have my drum set at IU. So I had to borrow drums from a buddy of mine and I didn't have a car. So they rented me a car so I could get out to uh, Mellencamp studio on a regular basis. I was like, Wow, this is all happening very quickly. Uh, and and was, I ended up doing dance, that. Was dance naked, right? Dance naked, yeah. With uh, uh, Wild Night being uh, the the big single, and Kenny, of course. Like I think I did maybe like five or five or so tracks with him, um, and they they kept one. So I'm on drums on one song on that record, a song called LUV. Uh, yeah. But Kenny plays on Wild Night with uh, Michelle and Dege Ocello and uh and the rest of that record but uh that was that was that was a lot of fun at the time so that was uh that was that was the melon camp experience and then uh he brought me back uh, to do one song in 95 for a jimmy rogers tribute record when kenny was also put um so that was the that was the extent of my of the melon camp stuff so so you did that but, so uh, when, when did you make the move to nashville Nashville was in 97 after I was done at IU and uh, the whole, I chose Nashville kind of for the same reason that I chose IU because it was like not too far away from home. And I was kind of still petrified about moving to a big city at that time. Uh, and when in about 97, you remember the whole thing I called arena country was taking place where Garth Brooks and uh, Shania Twain were were packing out, you know, arenas all over, all over the world, and that just with the music business in the state that it was, which was booming in the mid '90s, it yeah. kind of made it sound like they were handing out gigs at the border, like that there was all this work, all this, oh yeah, young drummers should come to Nashville, and so, so I was like, okay, um, kind of not knowing at the time. At, you know, realizing in hindsight that the you know, the country music recording world and stuff like that was still down to a very limited, close knit family, right? Like it was it was still a, a, you know a lot of guys like uh, uh, um, uh, Eddie Bayers and uh, Larry London probably who were still probably doing the majority of those of those records. Um, but I did uh, I, I I got a couple of gigs and and that was fun. Um, I got, I got a gig with a cover outfit in, if you're familiar with Nashville, there's a place called Printer's Alley. And, uh, there was, uh, one of the tiny little holes in the wall was an after hours bar. And, uh, I got a gig playing three to 6 AM on Wednesday night slash Thursday morning, uh, just doing covers filled, you know, with a, a big bar full of people. All the people who don't want to go home on a Wednesday morning, and it was <laughs> that the the makeup that was like the Star Wars canteen. It was pretty. And then of course you know you load out, and the sun's coming up, and uh, you know I get my egg McMuffin on the way home, and then and go to sleep. But um, 
in Nashville, uh, the the person that uh, was uh, really valuable to me was Cinderella drummer Fred Curry. Yeah. Uh, I had seen because uh, I was looking to like, okay, I need to record a demo. I need to do something. And he had his own studio in Nashville at the time, and he had placed an ad in the newspaper. And so I, I called him up and said, hey, I studied with Kenny uh, and ended up uh, becoming friends with Fred. And he actually, he wanted to engineer at the studio at the time. So he brought me in to play on a couple of records. And uh, in 98, I think it was, Cinderella reunited and went back out on tour. And one of the bands that they took with them was an LA band called Hair of the Dog. And when Hair of the Dog was looking for a new drummer, Fred gave my name to them, and that led me to moving to LA in '99. Interesting, very interesting. So, so Fred, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I mean, listen, Fred himself is a phenomenal player. He is, yeah, really, really, and a, and a and a great guy too. Yeah, great guy, great groove. Yeah. I mean, he's just so solid at everything he does, and and I, I enjoyed the band. It was really great, to, great to to have that level. So. Here it is, your meetups. So how'd you meet Fred in the first place to even allow him to kind of assist you with all this here? Oh, I, after he placed that ad, I, I called him and told him that I was looking for, uh, so I just wanted to record a demo. Uh, and he called me back and, and we talked for a little bit and he, and he said uh, that I sounded at least halfway decent on the phone. I remember saying, I didn't sound like, I want to go and record some drums. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you, you know, we had similar, and of course, you know, again, I was a fan of, uh, you know, Fred was a name that I had seen in, in Metal Edge and Hit Parader growing up too. Um, but he, he was just really cool. And we, you know, I, I was able to to hang out at his studio a couple of times. Um, to this day, I still thank him when I see him and and he's probably really sick of it, but I will always be indebted <laughs> uh, uh, to Fred. Because he, he, I guess he got to see me, you know, uh, what I could do as a player. And so, yeah, when he knew the hair of the dog guys when they they toured with cinderella in 98 right um and then he goes i i think i got your guys so they uh the hair of the dog guys actually ended up flying to nashville and i auditioned for them in my basement uh playing a couple of songs for them and they're like all right want to move to la and i'm like all right guess this is happening so now you make you make the move to la now you from yeah. nashville back out to la you go out there you get settled in and here the dog. You did two. Was it two albums with them? Two albums. Yeah, their their first one had started to make some noise, and uh, the second one uh, was the album that ended up being called Rise, uh, and produced by Michael Wagner. Ironically, uh, out in Nashville. So actually, um, since they knew they wanted to, they were going to have Michael. Like Michael Wagner was already brought on board to produce r before I joined. And right. so we actually did the record before I moved. Like since the record was done in Nashville, I was like, oh, this works out great. Um, so I got to pack up kind of as we were recording the record. And as soon as the record was done, I made the move uh, out, out west to L.A. Uh, we got signed by a label called Spitfire Records. Right. That uh, ended up signing a whole bunch of new bands, but I yeah. think made a chunk of their income by they bought back catalogs from uh, a number of bands, including, I think, Twisted Sister, although not Stay Hungry. Um, Dio, Ronnie Dio was on Spitfire for a little bit. Wow. Uh, Zach Wild put out uh, uh, some records on Spitfire. So I think that was their, uh, the main source, but they tried you know, their hand with a number of new bands, including Hair of the Dog. And, you know, we, we, we were, you know, you get told, all right, the, go see these guys. You know, they're gonna be huge. They're gonna be touring the world. and. Uh, Unfortunately, it, it didn't take off as, as much as, as certainly, you know, we'd hoped. But another huge learning experience, the first real professional record getting to do uh, all the way through with Michael Wagner, that was a, a, another big first for me. And, um, and then the first real taste of touring was uh, with Hair of the Dog. We got to, uh, and watch your feet, because I'm going to drop some names. Uh, we, you know, we got to play with, with uh, Motorhead. I uh, got to tour with LA Guns. Um, Nashville Pussy, uh, the Super Suckers, uh, oh. some of like really just fun, fun bands. First show I ever played with them, we got to open up for Ted Nugent at the House of Blues, and that was That'd a kick great. as well. And so, um, yeah, that was uh, uh, again, didn't take off as much as we hoped, but 
I still have people, you know, who, who write me and tell me how much they love those records. And that's, it's like, man, appreciate the, that. <laughs> the other record was, was Ignite. Ignite was one of those records, right? Yes. And the highlight for, for me on that one, I think for all of us was, uh, we, we brought Lemmy in after we had toured with him. We were like, uh, you know, can we, we bring him to sing vocals on a record? And we told that his, his rider, we're like, what do you, what do you need? What do you need to be comfortable? And, uh, he needed a bag of whiskey, a, a bottle of whiskey and a bag of Ruffles potato chips. <laughs> and we're like, done. Sure. We'll get you a limo too. So we picked him up and I, I remember that day cause he did his vocal part in like 15 minutes, you know, Ryan cook sang him something like this. He goes, all right. And he goes in the studio and he knocks it out. And then for like just the next hour, we just listened to him tell motorhead stories and it just <laughs> so much fun. He, he was another one of those like nicest guys ever. You know, he, Lemmy was just, you know, an icon. He was amazing. Fantastic. So now was it after hair of the dog, you hit up with Eric, Sardinas, and it was kind that's of like right. A, a, right, and from that point on, that's and that took him more to international traveling, right? Yes, that was the. Uh, unfortunately, I never got to go international with Hair of the Dog. Um, Eric had the same manager as mm -hmm. Hair of the Dog at the time, so we had gone to see Eric several times. Always just a blast, or always blown away because I'd never seen. You know, I was kind of familiar with blues but never seen it the way he played and for those who haven't seen him you know he plays a dobro but plays it cranked up through a martial stack and with like major distortion it's like it is it, it's still traditional blues but it's a very rock and roll way to play it because it's just loud and and raucous a lot of the time uh so we we knew we knew eric and uh, about the time he lost his drummer was about the time that hair the dog at uh kind of the end of 2001 knew it's like all right this is kind of not happening and we decided to 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 put the band to rest yeah. um and so yeah I, I was able to audition for eric and eric gave me the first taste of international touring uh because he was already doing that he was already becoming a big name in the blues circuit and yeah. actually the very First show I ever played with Eric was in Germany, the very first time I had ever been there. Oh man, terrified. <laughs> uh, but Eric went um, to some really unusual places that I I, I don't know if there are uh, a lot of other people that go there. You know, we went to um, the Azor Islands off the coast of Portugal. Beautiful. We went to the Canary Islands. We go, you know, people say what was your favorite place to go in Europe? Was it London or was it Paris? Or something like that. No, Croatia, yeah, Croatia. Like Bulgaria, all of those IA countries, you know, it's like, Oh man, just amazing people and culture and scenery. And like everything about it was just so beautiful. Um, so Eric, you know, went all over the place and just doing laps and laps around not only the States, but also, you know, back and forth to Europe quite a bit. So what did you so, find out? I mean, now you're playing Eric, you're playing blues, which is a whole different, a whole different, you know, genre of what you were playing. What was it like? First of all, how were the the audiences in Europe compared to what you were experiencing in the States? Any difference? Um, yes. And I especially noticed that over the next few years with the rise of cell phones, in that, you know, later on as cell phones got bigger, you know, here's 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 every audience in the States. Yeah. You can see my, my, there's my family, but yeah, just holding up like, you know, videotaping it. Oh, I'm so going to enjoy this later. Once I post it online and Europe, it's like they, there's it really is a different mentality over there where they realize that as a member of the audience, you've got a part to play as well. And so, you know, the, the cheering, the dancing, the applause, the singing along way bigger over there. And of course, blues audiences being what they were uh, and I, I think still are, uh, you know, they appreciate, they love the blues, they'll cheer, but then Eric comes out and just rips and cranks and, you know, his stage persona was huge. And, you know, there he is, you know, he lights the bar on fire, you know, plays slide with a beer bottle and then it explodes and people, you know, go like, oh my God, they'd never seen anything like that before. And so I, you know, having, and so it was totally appropriate for me to play a Texas shuffle while banging my head as, as hard as I could. Uh <laughs> And so in that, yeah, we, we, we look forward to, you know, ripping up, you know, eating blues audiences alive as much as we could, but, uh, you know, great fun. And I, I was with Eric for about, uh, three years, um, 
before it just, you know, became about time to go. But, uh, you know, I, I still see Eric now and then. And uh, just he's amazing. I was like, if you haven't checked him out, do yourself a favor and go see him live. He's just he never disappointed at all. Absolutely. Man. So you're, you're really kind of getting around. So now you're, you're, you're globe trotting at that point. So now how did Wasp come about? How did that start? Um, in 2005, at that point, I was now working a straight job. Uh, I, the first gig I could get was for a, a magazine distribution company in Eagle Rock because uh, I had a I had a pickup truck at the time, so I was able to work. And um, I w- and, and doing as many gigs around LA as I could find, including just some cover band stuff. Uh, and uh, like one of the one of the gigs was in one of the beaches playing like Beatles and Zeppelin covers on Saturday afternoons. Mm. Uh, and down there, and one of the guitar players that I met through there was a player named Mark Zavon. And he uh, he already knew, unbeknownst to me, he knew uh, Blackie and Mike Duda, the bass player. Uh, and so when Wasp was looking for a new guy, um, I and uh, he, he relayed my name to them, but I'll never forget when I got the call because, you know, I'm working this job that I had to be at like at 5, 5.30 in the morning. I was, you know, very tired, was very broke. And I remember like kind of sitting on the edge of my bed going, man, like what am I going to be able to stay in L.A.? What am I going to do? And the phone rings and it's and it's Zavon. And he goes, uh, he goes hey, Mike, it's, I've, I've got someone that might be looking for a drummer. And I'm like, you know, yeah, OK, well, you know, what do we got? He goes, it's actually Wasp. It's like, oh, interesting. Um, short story long. Over the next few days. Like I, I I got I got the phone call. That was a that was a Monday. On the next night, I go over to meet Mike Duda, who hands me a bunch of CDs. All right, learn these four songs. <laughs> uh, and uh, okay, and I, and I talked to Blackie on the phone. I think for about twenty minutes, and he told me what what Wasp needed as a drummer. And uh, I I called in sick to work, um, and then auditioned. Uh, or, or like, you know, tried out, practice those songs, auditioned on a Wednesday. And uh, Blackie said that I, I was actually the only a drummer at that point that he had hired on the spot, on the spot because yeah. he auditioned. And he's like, he's like, what do you got going on? I'm like, well, I got this delivery job Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, and he goes, okay, um, tomorrow's going to have to be your last day of work. <laughs> okay. All right. Done. You know, uh, and so I, I I was aboard and we went straight into recording the uh, what became the Dominator record, uh, which was the first record I did with them. Uh, and then tour, 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 tour. Wasp hit the road, mostly in Europe. We only did the States twice the whole time I was in the band. Mm-hmm. And uh, but Europe a lot. I I, I don't want to sound like a brag because it, it, it's mostly to my horrible memory. But like I, I've lost count. The number of times that we went to Europe, we did there a lot every summer and almost every fall, because Wasp. Uh, well, I think they Wasp might have hit their peak in the U.S. with popularity in like you know eighty eight, eighty nine, but it only continued to grow in Europe. They they remain a, a pretty big force over there. Boy, f- fantastic! I got to bring up I got to bring up a question by Joe Bergamini. And Joe is a real a real fan of oh, Wasp. Hi, Joe. And uh, <laughs> you mentioned about how you got the gig with Wasp with Wasp. What was, you know, Blackie Loyal, what was he looking for in a drummer? What, what was exactly what did they find that they found that the magic that you had? The, the big phrase that he told me over the phone that night before I met him in person to audition for him, he goes, we need someone to bring the thunder. Mm-hmm. And later on, I would take that, to meet, uh, take that to mean he did have some pretty specifics about what he wanted the drums to do. He was not a real big fan of, say, like, tricky syncopated fills or something like that. Um, he wanted, you know, rolls down the toms or rolls. He wanted it to stay constant. You know, I, I couldn't do the in the air tonight by Phil Collins fill on a song, you know, unless I was putting accents, you know, I couldn't go. I had to go like that and keep it, keep the intensity up. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like not leaving that space when it's supposed to be, uh, you know, when you're supposed to muscle through um, gear, gear wise. Also, 
Um, I mean, and it's, you know, he wanted someone consistent. Uh, a lot of the parts were very specific uh, in terms of, you know, the accents or where certain kicks or certain fills would be. So I needed to pay attention and, and like, you know, so song starts and stops and things like that. He also asked me uh, when I came aboard, he goes, how would you feel about not using a ride symbol? Because he had actually grown tired of, you know, uh, you know, you get to a verse and you get big, sloshy, powerful hi-hats. And then you go to a ride and you play the bell. And the to a certain extent, the bottom can kind of drop out yeah, yeah, when yeah. you do that. Um, so he goes, he goes, just just play a big crash and just wail on it. Because he he liked more that Keith Moon, um, Bunny Carlos type yeah. of mentality where, where he goes, it's almost like another guitar. Yeah. When you're filling out the, the you know, the sonically that sound that which yeah. is why, um, oh, what a segue into the product plug to this 20 inch <laughs> HHX evolution ride. Thank you, Mr. Weckel, for coming <laughs> up with this because this is not, I found like for a medium to soft volume, it's not only an amazing ride, but like to, to bash this and it just it sounds gorgeous, it's so full and deep and juicy. Um, so instead of a ride. Um, yeah, I would have a 20 inch crash to my right side, whether it was like a crash ride. Uh, the rock crash was always good. 20 inch AAX explosion. Uh, I had a variety of them, but just something that that would fill it out with that, you know, that juicy fullness as I crashed on it. Um, so, so interesting. So, well, while we're on the symbols, let's talk about your symbols and, and your setup and, and sure. the symbols that you have, the sizes you have, where you position them. Just talk about that because it's really, you know, powerful the way you have your setup. Sure. Um, these are 15 inch HHX groove hats. Uh, my actually first and only pair of 15s. I played 14s for years until like I saw guys like uh, it might have been Rich Redman that I saw and he had like the I was like, I can't remember they were 16 or 18 inch hats or these huge hats. I'm like, those sound killer. I should get something bigger. So I talked to my man Chris Stanky and uh, he's like, why don't you try the groove hats? So I tried those and just love them. Just absolutely beautiful. Um, but I've used the HHX, or excuse me, AAX stage hats and the HH medium hats in the past too. Although those sound great. Yeah. Uh, got an HHX 18 explosion crash, AAX 18 explosion crash. Um, my favorite symbol ever, the 19 inch AAX explosion crash. I, Whenever I'm recording, unless it's like, you know, if it's like a smaller club or small, if it might be too much, I'll, I'll scale it back and use the 16s and 17s. But the 19 inch AAX explosion is just my favorite symbol of all time. It's just, it's so juicy and perfect. Um, I've got, uh, when I do use a ride, I've got an HH uh, power bell for the metal stuff, but I also like the rock ride and the raw bell dry ride uh, for, you know, lower volume applicate, you know, slightly lower volume. Uh, those work great too. Um, 19 inch Holy China, my favorite China of all time. And then the, the 20 inch Evolution Ride that I use as uh, right now using as a, a crash wash to play on the side. Boy, fantastic. So, you have so do you have, is that pretty much your setup that you use when you go out or do you sometimes, you know, replace them with different stuff? Sure. This is, uh, I mean, for recording some of the, some of the metal projects that uh, I'm doing, um, usually something about like this. If I'm just, you know, going to be playing Tom Petty covers, or, you know, Zeppelin covers, might not need quite as many crashes. Maybe just, you know, two crashes and a ride and, a, mm -hmm. and a, you know, throw in a, the, you know, 10-inch AAX splash or something like that. Um, but generally, if I can, something about like this, you know, scaling down, like I said, the smaller sizes and the rides that aren't quite as dominating like the power bill, um, mm -hmm. you know, I try and do it. I, I tell my students, and they're too young to remember, but you remember that movie City Slickers, um, yeah. where Billy Crystal gets in gets into that that heated discussion with one of the ice cream guys, where he goes, "I can pick the perfect ice cream with a flavor," and Billy Crystal goes, "All right, if asparagus sautéed," and he goes, "Like, all right, okay." So, like, when picking up my my symbols, I'm like, "All right, it's a Thursday night. I'm playing this club. There's carpet on the stage. I'm going to be in the corner." You know, and, and 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 trying like to go, all right, which ride is going to be the, you know, appropriate one? And of course, I'll bring like, you know, two or three because as you know, a lot of times with cover stuff, you you, you start off, 
lower in, in volume. And then, uh, you know, as the night goes on, people drink, more people dance, and then, yeah. you know, it can get, can get louder. Like, all right, we're going to swap out and put the rock right up now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was something for, that Kenny actually installed. Like, you know, take more gear than you need. You know, I, that's why I take, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's just Zeppelin and Beatles stuff. I'll take three snares just so I have, you know, just in case. So I have them uh, in case I need it. But very, very smart. But that, that's what makes yeah. you the pro that you are. As a pro, man, you go in there fully prepared. <laughs> You're ready to yeah. hit me. A, a, a gentleman that I've known for years because I, I went to a high school with him is D. Snyder. What was it like working with D. Snyder? Oh, well, nerve wracking at first for the same reason I, I, you know, was hyped up and trying to play it cool. But he said, Dom Familiar. I'm like, oh, because, of course, I was I, I had, you know, Twisted Sister Records, um, Stay Hungry, still one of the classics. Um, and uh, one of the there, there was a, a gentleman who was on the staff with Wasp for a little bit, who also started working later with D. And uh, D had, you know, gone through a, a, a couple of guys. And um, Jason Sutter, who had been playing with D at the time, actually landed the gig with Cher uh, mm -hmm. and was going to be uh, Cher's full time. So the slot opened up and I got to kind of uh, audition and uh, just kind of got the gig um, along uh, those lines, I guess, partially because, he, you know, they had seen what I had done with Wasp and, of course, uh, you know, already familiar with a lot of the music. Um, but that was that was a kick. One of the biggest things that I got to do with D that actually I never did with Wasp was background vocals. Um, I'm not. I mean, I'm. I'll do karaoke with the best of them, you know. But and, and I, I don't have that strong of a voice to be a lead singer. But my pitch is pretty good, and I'm pretty good at you know matching tones and notes for for backup deals. But when I started playing with D, doing that while you know bashing and hitting as hard as he could. Had to really start lo losing or uh, 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 using some breath control because you know to hold out uh, a, a note for two bars while I'm bashing it was all like ah ah and and you know that took practice. Uh, but D is D is like Kenny. I think he's one of those like completely in your face guys, but it's all extremely positive. And he goes out there and oh man, does he still have fun? He cannot wait to get out there on the stage, and yeah, and you can see he he eats audience, you know, the audience is alive also. Um, so a lot of fun, you know. Got to got to talk. Of course, you know, he put up with some of my fanboy questions too, uh, but that was just an absolute blast. Uh, he ended up doing that metal record. And mm -hmm. using uh, uh, Jamie Josta's guys who are on the East Coast, and that yeah. kind of became his new touring outfit. So it was only, uh, you know, a, a fairly short time. I think I got to do maybe about, tw I, I think like twelve or thirteen shows with him. But uh, just uh, absolute blast, so much fun. And uh, you know, if he ever wants to give me a buzz again, I am at the ready. Oh, I'm sure. That I'm just, sure that's going to happen. I'm sure that's going to happen for sure. So, so then you go on. You you graduate at MI. You start teaching at MI, and and you're there doing your thing there. I mean, you know. So, how does that feel now doing the teaching thing? And of course, because of the pandemic, a lot of the he teaching yeah. is, is virtually on on, uh, on on formats like this. So, how does that feel? That's right. Yeah. Um, I had, I had made. I kind of got forced into doing a, a big. Uh, virtual switch because uh, in addition to Musicians Institute, um, where which is kind of funny, it's like you, you'd be amused to know. Like I actually, before I went to to finish my degree at Musicians Institute, I actually I did a clinic there. I did a couple of what they call open counseling, where someone comes in and they're there for two hours to play and answer questions. I did that, and then I became a student, and then I graduated from from MI, and then I eventually join the staff as, as a permanent member. So I might be, I, I might be one of the only guys who like did clinics and then like actually then went to the school. Uh, but MI is, is wonderful. And I also, I do, uh, I, I teach at another place, a more kids music school, uh, kid oriented music school called join the band yeah. in Van Nuys. Um, they got some notoriety a few years ago because uh, Dave Grohl put uh, he put out this short film called Play, and it was about music education. Yeah. Uh, his daughters actually were students that joined the band, and he he had even like been there. And if you if you watch Play, if you just go to YouTube and search Dave Grohl Play, it's on there. 
the 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 shots of the music school of the kids taking lessons that was at the join the band so i'm teaching there too so when lockdown happened yeah mi and join the band had to go virtual and i had to kind of up my technical game by like you know getting an interface and and getting something uh that was going to sound decent because as i'm sure you've heard you know playing your drums through a phone just like all right now i want you to play this and it just sounds like you know like i couldn't make out any of that um but the, we found that like the parents and the students whether they were mi or or join the band seemed to to make the the jump to virtual without too much of a problem yeah. um yeah like my students seem to seem to do okay with it um the only difference being you know you can't physically be there to you know adjust something on their kid or 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 to uh, you know you, you can't see everything that they're doing uh all the time because a lot of the students don't have you know the the multi-camera setups like fred dinkins does uh <laughs> which is awesome because I, I watched you interview fred the other night too and i saw like fred's got like 15 cameras all over like oh that's the next step i need to do that um but most of them seem to be in, seem to be enjoying it yeah. uh hopefully you know knock on for micah everything will you know be coming to an end hopefully reasonably soon and stuff can uh, and open back up but i was thinking about that going but the cool thing about virtual lessons is is you know now it's like i can still teach lessons to someone or now i'm better equipped to teach lessons to someone in norway um which i did a couple months months back on on that uh the meat hook app uh there was a, a kid in in norway that just was a big wasp fan and he goes he goes hey, let's do a lesson i'm like yeah sure and uh so you know just get to you know, talk about drums and he mainly just wanted to hear wasp stories, but it was, it was a lot of fun. So now I'm hoping that the future will be, you know, uh, we can go back to some of the in-person thing, you know, the campus at MI will open back up completely and join the band as well. Uh, but you know, people now will probably be even better equipped to do virtual lessons and say, Oh, I can't make it across town today, uh, to your practice space. Uh, let's just do virtual. We'll do it. We'll do a zoom lesson from home. I'd be like, sure, absolutely. We can do that. This is now 21st century education. It's happening, you know, not only in the, in the music industry, but in every industry, the way they're teaching now. And it's something where there are certain students that are going to want to come in person and some students are going to want to stay virtually. So, and yeah. now that you reach the globe now becomes our, our potential reach. I have been doing this for many, many years and uh, it's the, uh, it's, it's exciting and reaching people, uh, you know, just <laughs> today alone, I've already taught into five different countries even before this interview. So it's fantastic. Nice. People That's that awesome. Have joined us here, like people that have joined us from around the world, I told them, you got to come on and join. You got to hear Mike's story. And they're with us now. But I got a question from them I want to put up here. This is from Chris. Check this out. From Chris DiCiera. Hi, Mike. If you plateaued in your double bass speed, say 16th notes, how would you recommend bumping your speed, especially if your left foot is not as strong? And he's saying, great to see you. Thank you, Chris. Oh, cool. Thank you, Chris. Yes, I, I, Chris, I think ha has uh, written me a couple of times like uh, on Facebook too. Um, with double bass um, in, in my clinics, like I, I prepared this thing, it said the, the secret to double bass and to playing like some faster metal stuff is Barry White. Let me explain. Um, you know, the, the late, great Barry White. Yeah. Oh man. If I had a singing voice, I wouldn't be playing drums if I had a voice like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. But you know, he played just that, you know, that, that soothing funk that just makes you go, Oh yeah. But I noticed on some of those grooves, you know, the, like the right hand on some of those drummers would be going pretty quick, you know, and it's like, that's, that takes a little bit. Right. And the trick to that obviously is to stay relaxed. And I noticed on some of the, the metal stuff that my limbs would be moving at that tempo. You know, you, you put on, uh, what, a battery by Metallic or something like that. And that's pretty close yeah. to that six note speed that, that Barry White had. So I'm like, all right, well, I can do Barry White, no problem, because, you know, I'm, I'm going, huh. You know, you hear that voice, and it's just like, everything's all right. You know, <laughs> but I, I play Metallic, and it's like, doo, doo, and, you know, cramps tense dude, and the whole thing falls apart. So I started trying to play Metallica or, or Slayer as if I was playing Barry White. And I started doing that to um, 
uh, double bass as well and working on specifically working on my left foot, like uh, Chris was mentioning, um, playing like even just like eighth notes with the hands and a two and four backbeat, but doing sixteenth notes with the left foot. You know, one E and a two E and a three E and a four. If you can see my my left leg, sure. And doing and then, but you know, if you feel it getting tense, you got to practice relaxing. Practice, you know, get getting that. Uh, what here's another name for you? What Jonathan Mover referred to as a controllable flutter. Uh, when I saw him in a clinic, uh, and you know, to, to in the same way that you know, you can take the stick and just go like this without thinking about it, applying that same thing to your feet and giving your left foot a little bit of extra work if that's what it, it needs. And then when you crank up the speed, no matter if it's, you know, like, you know, one E and, or, you know, like the E's and us, like the thrash skank beat, one and two and three and four, and just keeping that, you know, now it's like, I'll put, I'll put, you know, Slayer and Testament on. And actually I find it very relaxing because I listen to it, you know, because, you know, it, it was a hard lesson to learn that, you know, for as invigorating as that music made me feel, the relaxing was what was actually going to let me play an hour of, you know, fast double bass. And then I say, and and just give it time. Keep trying to relax with your feet. Um, I definitely plateaued for a while, but, you know, keep keep that chart, you know, where you, your, your metronome markings, you know, on this day you hit 160 comfortably. Next day you get 162 and you will see your numbers go up and up gradually if you keep after it. And I, that, and just like I said, learning to relax with your feet because you're not going to hit, you know, the, the, you, you can't get that kind of speed with the same intensity as, you know, rearing back and fire with your hands or lifting your leg up, you know, halfway to the ceiling. It, it, it's got to be a more controlled flutter. So, uh, just give it, give it time and the persistence and work your left foot more, uh, then you're right. So that it, it, it catches up so that your feet will be more even. Boy, great. That's my, my, <laughs> great, great advice, Mike. You know, you mentioned Testament with the great Gene Hoagland, another phenomenal player who's oh. uh, also powerful but totally relaxed. Mike, I got to thank you so much yeah. you know, for Sabian and, and the Sabian Education Network. You have done great today. It's been phenomenal to have your, your, oh, ex, your advice to be shared. We have got tons of people that are also on Facebook and YouTube at the same time. So you'll have some chance to go back and uh, see some of the comments and see what these people reacting to it. This will go on awesome. forever. So. People will watch this. Thank you so much for your time. You have done fantastic. Dude, I just, I, I, I don't want to throw out the term honored, <laughs> you know, very easily, but dude, it's to, to talk to you today has, is a huge honor for me. So thank you guys so much for having me aboard, man. This is, it's been a blast. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you for all your support okay. for Saving, you know, what you do in the Saving Education Network. Keep it going. Anybody contact MikeDupka.com. Go to his website. Track him down. Let's keep it going. Mike, thank you so much. You've done really, really great. Thank you so much, Dom. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.